Back when we were a big job shop, there was a foreman that I worked under, and it got to the point where I would do most of the setups for the lathe, even the complicated aerospace ones. I had only set up and operated machines though. I never wanted to get into programming because I didn't want that kind of responsibility. We'd have talks and meetings about learning programming, but I'd think of different excuses or hope that they would forget about it because of how busy we were. Eventually though, that foreman left. We fell behind with aerospace work and we had a big stack of jobs that were approaching the deadline that we took. And in spite of him telling my dad that we started on them and that we were working on them, none of these jobs had programs or even had CAD models in some cases. So we had a large stack of work that absolutely needed to get done with a strict deadline, and we had no other lathe programmers and a very busy mill department. After finding out that that foreman quit, my dad came to me, told me what happened, showed me the prints, and told me that we weren't going to hire another programmer and that I had two weeks. Good luck. I'm kidding, he wouldn't throw me into the fire like that, but he did tell me that we had these jobs that we absolutely needed to get done, and he asked me if I could step up to program them. And of course, I was terrified of scrapping the parts. I had never did programming before because I always avoided it, but I had been around to do all of the setups and operations for all of these other complicated jobs that we did before. So I knew how to get the jobs done and what kind of tool paths I wanted, I just needed that last step on how I could tell that machine what it is that it needs to do that was in my head. So dad and I discussed how we were going to approach the parts, what were the most important features, and then we also made some phone calls and got some help from Mastercam to get a quick rundown on the software. And we also talked to our tool providers with advice on speeds and feeds and what kind of tools that we should use to run these jobs. After a little less than two weeks, we had every part on the job done, approved, and shipped to the customer on time. And of course, because of all the good work we did, we got even busier and busier. If you come to our shop, you'll see a lot of similar aerospace parts when you walk in. We have them on display because it's something to take pride in, all the complicated work that we used to do in the past. Pretty much all of the round parts were all parts that I did or Travis did when he joined the company. But what a lot of people don't know is that a lot of the aerospace parts that we used to do were all done on a two-axis lathe. This was before we ran Dusans and other high-end machines. I won't mention names on what kind of machines they were, but a lot of actual machinists probably wouldn't believe me if we told them what kind of machine they were and what tolerances we had on those parts. It was a lot of work too, indicating parts for second ops, tapping in parts so they'd beat tolerances, backing off offsets because we couldn't trust the machine to run tight tolerances two parts in a row. And then because it was only a two axis lathe, we'd have to coordinate with the mill department to figure out the best way that they could receive the parts to finish off the mill features. Sometimes we'd have to get creative with the order that we did operations or the way that we held parts for the final operations because you have all kinds of crazy true position callouts or concentricity callouts. But there was never a time that we told the customer the part was impossible. We always figured out a way to get the job done with the machines we had. Even after all that, I was still 100% only a lathe operator. If we were really behind, I'd do whatever the shop needed and push buttons on the mills to get things out of the door but I had never really did anything too technical on a mill. Eventually though, that changed because we got our first live tooling lathe, finally forcing me to jump into the world of milling. I got a little training on the machine itself, but the CAM software at the time was easy to figure out, and with a little bit of advice from our mill department, me and Travis were able to work our way around the new machine and start taking back work that we had sent to the mill department originally for final operations, doing it all on a single machine. After that, we got our first double spindle live tooling lathe. It was all stuff we were familiar with, aside from it having a new control, but it felt right at home after coming from a live tooling lathe. I did quickly learn about the z-axis being reversed on the subchuck though. You don't really forget that when you learn it and it had a lot more power than I had before, so I could make some really crazy parts. That was a nice machine and I got comfortable on it, but eventually though, we got even new technology in. 
the big SMX 3100 9-axis machine. It's the biggest machine that I've ever been put in charge of, and it's a complete beast. It was a twin spindle machine, just like the previous machine that I was used to, but now it had a real honest-to-god milling spindle on it with proper axis rotations. And because of that, I had to jump into another world that I wasn't really familiar with, 5-axis machining. Thankfully, I'm surrounded by some of the best people in the industry, and I'm thankful for our partners and my coworkers who are always there if I need help with something. I need some help getting my footing to start programming a proper 5-axis toolpath, but with everyone's help and the experience that I had running 2-axis lathe, 3-axis live tooling lathes, twin spindle lathes, and all these different machines that I had ran in the past, I was quickly able to grasp how to run this machine. It's funny because once in a while you'll see people walk through our shop and they see the SMX and how crazy of a machine it is. It's an intimidating machine to look at with 80 tool stations, two big chucks, a lathe turret, a milling spindle, a gigantic working area, and my favorite part to mention, you have to run two programs at the same time and make sure that they don't interfere with each other. It's a monster, but if you step back and break the machine down, it's all familiar stuff. You program your lathe ops like usual. The milling is just like a regular mill. Five axis work is programmed the exact same way as a five axis. There's some differences in this machine like the tool orientation and setting up your work planes. But if you've ran these other machines before, the basics are all the same. You just have to kind of break down the machine into parts and approach it one at a time. If there's anything I wish I did, it's that I took the learning the machines and programming that I wasn't familiar with a little more seriously. I did get it down eventually, but it was always down to the wire when we needed to learn it. But for everyone out there, they've got it really good. When I was learning how to program machines, I'd had to make phone calls, ask for help, go on Google and hope that I could find something pertaining to how to run this part or what kind of material I'm running. But now there's an academy online that teaches you how to program lathes, how to program mills, 5-axis, 9-axis, grinding machines, whatever machines you want to learn. Learning all of these machines, even the ones that you're not currently running, will prepare you for the time when it's time to run the big league machines, like the SMX 3100 or the Hellers. And the best thing about all of this, it's all free. All of our content online is free for anybody anywhere to sit down and learn how to program. So thank you very much for listening. If you like this video and you like what we're doing, please like and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Thank you.